Prior to my release from prison, I was required to take a psychological evaluation exam administered by a doctor. At that point, they told me I was safe enough to return to society. Said things like, well-rounded and intelligent. But written in bold on my release paper was the word narcissist. Narcissist. Apparently my expectations of my future were too high. And the doctor implied that I should lower them for my future. And not to expect a lot out of life from here on out. And I can only presume that the doctor came to that deduction through years of studying books and numbers rather than studying hearts and faces. I understand what she meant. I mean, statistically, close to 70% of all inmates released from prison return within two years. So why wouldn't you go with the statistic? Why wouldn't you bank on me failing? Why not? Why would I be the outlier? Well, two years after my release, I graduated from community college with honors, and I was the keynote speaker. After that, I received a scholarship for writing and a degree in graphic design. So I just want to thank that doctor, the one who called me a narcissist, because she was right. I am a narcissist. I am confident and I am capable and I believe in myself. I am the outlier and I am on fire. My name is Sean Williams and this is Open Fire. That's been so cold Look in my face All the stories it will tell I can't hear Just one more song A little something to remind you when I'm gone When I'm gone All right, so what do you want to know? What was your first reaction to being arrested? <laughs> oh, wow, that's a pretty big size 11 in my fucking face. The cops kicked me in the face when they arrested me. So my first reaction was, <laughs> ow. Wait, they kicked you in the face? Yes. For what purpose? Well, they were, uh, they had a warrant for our arrest, and then they came in and threw us on the ground, and one of the cops kicked me in the face. He was wearing New Balance sneakers. White, dirty. I was already on the ground. Complying. Complying, and they kicked me in the face. Well, jokes on him, he was wearing New Balance. <laughs> yeah, New Balance. Up close and personal. I don't hold it against them. We all get 
caught up in the moment. But, so yeah, that was my first reaction. Ow. And then it was, holy shit, my life is over. And I was right. Now you're here. Yeah. My life was over. And it had to be. If I could meet that cop that kicked me in the face, I would thank him. Because that day that I was arrested saves my life. I wouldn't thank him for the fucking kick to the jaw, because that was a little unnecessary, but... Whatever. Maybe I deserve that too. Everything changed at that point. Every every little bit of drug addicted denial I I had produced over those months of my crimes faded away and like not to be cliche but the harsh reality set in and it set in with handcuffs and drug withdrawals and fights and the pain didn't stop it didn't stop there started missing my family and I wanted to commit suicide because it's my first time in jail I didn't know how to react my bail was a million dollars I wasn't coming home anytime soon so I have to I had to Look at my son through bulletproof glass for 16 months straight, unable to touch him. Couldn't hug my mother. Well, needless to say, I I didn't commit suicide. I actually grew up in prison. I became a man. from relearning the words accountability and responsibility to learning how to fight again. And not just with my fists. I learned how to fight depression. I learned how to fight giving up. And after a while of being without all the luxuries of, that come with freedom, you know, seeing your family, being able to go to sleep when you want, wake up when you want, go out and get a job and work and be productive. After all that, I succumbed to starting over and I changed my mind. And um, after three years of being incarcerated, I made a promise to myself that I would never go back. And I haven't. And I won't. I live by a fucking lake now. Because I didn't give up.
and I have nice neighbors. Yeah, I like them too. <laughs> Do they know I'm an ex-felon? Probably not. <laughs> the but landlord I, does, doesn't he? Kind of. Yeah, that's that's a whole different story. That's a great story, actually. Yeah, but he likes you, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, he because does. he doesn't care about your past, he just makes wants to make sure you're taking care of. Yeah. The house. Whatever. So, um, yeah, let's just talk about that. The one of the the benefits that lasts forever being an ex-con is having to check a box anytime you apply for something important in your life, like a job or a lease on a new apartment. So in my experience, checking that box and being honest about my past has resulted in not getting any job whatsoever. I, I've literally had people from human resources tell me that there's no way we'll hire you because you're a red flag. No matter how bad I wanted to work, no matter how, how much I've changed. So fast forward to me getting my first apartment uh, on that application. There's that question. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And I checked no, because I was afraid that I would be immediately dismissed as a criminal. You know, can't be trusted. I'm a scumbag. I got a label stamped to my forehead that says he's bad news. But the owner of the house did a background check and saw my, my history. And he called me in for a second visit to the apartment and he confronted me about it. And I was ashamed. And I told him, I, I, I said, hey, would you check that box? And he proceeded to tell me that based on his first meeting with me and my work ethic and the fact that I was taking care of my son now, he didn't care what I did in the past. And he, <laughs> he said he, he just wanted his rent money on time, that's all. And, um, and he gave me the keys. And it was a, a milestone to be trusted, finally, from a stranger who knew my past. It, it spoke a lot to to humans and their their ability to exercise compassion. So that built confidence on levels I, I haven't had since high school. And now I have a nice apartment with a a big backyard and nice neighbors. So that's it about the apartment. Did it make you, when he first went away, did it make you feel like you failed as a parent? Kind of. But when his father passing away, it was hard. It was just me. And I tried my best, you know. Made sure he saw his son. Always there for him. Send him things, write to him, you know. So, I guess I turned out all right. <laughs> he turned out fine, you know. So hopefully I did something right. Maybe not soon enough, but. Um, while he was in prison, he hated me because I didn't want to go and see him. At the time, I was visiting a boyfriend of mine that was in jail, and I would go see him. And Sean wrote me a nasty letter, basically disowning me because I would go see him and not my brother. 
and I was trying to find the words to tell him that leaving my ex was totally different than leaving my blood. Like leaving my blood and watching him in there and I couldn't take him with me. I couldn't do it. I cried my whole way to the car, but I never told him because I didn't want him to worry about me as his sister because he had enough to worry about. So I had to deal with him hating me while he was in there because I, I couldn't bring myself to go see him because it hurt too much. And I didn't want him to see me in pain. I couldn't go and see him and say, oh, everything's fine when it really wasn't because I wanted him home. I didn't want him in there. And I couldn't under, I couldn't find the words to tell him the, to make him understand while he was in there. So I waited for him to come home. I remember one time, um, I wanted to see him so bad. And when I finally did, I ran up to him and jumped into his arms. I remember that. But when he got out, it, all those visits really made sense. It helped me get to know him more. And it was easier to connect with him afterwards. Do you have something to say? I did. What were you going to say? I was going to say that places like this used to freak me out. Why? Because there's a lot of people around. Well, you don't like people? I fucking hate people. Yeah, so do I. What? When... When I first got out, I figured that everyone around me would would know. Would know. Like, <laughs> like I was judging you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's psychotic, I know. But that that has since faded away. Now I just fucking hate people because it's Walmart. <laughs> yeah. But you didn't mention somebody else. Your father. Well, he was dead. <laughs> he died. I get that, but like, uh, how do you think he would have felt? Well, towards the end of his life, he was he was unaware of the negative happenings that I was involved in. What kills me today is that he never, he never had a, a chance to see me, not succeed, but just do well, do better for myself. That affects me. Like, um, I'm a good dad now. So there's that. He would have been... He would have been him. He wouldn't have been shocked or impressed. He, he just would have laughed and he would have been silently proud. I mean, shit. When I graduated college after I got out, that alone would have at least sparked a smile on his face. I'm not saying he was a bad guy. He was just a he was just a hard man. He was a good dad, though. Anyway, um, he's one of the main reasons I'm writing the book. 
because there's a lot of unanswered questions, unfinished chapters, if you will. Things that I have to express to get out. Just have some type of peace. I guess that could be influenced by the fact that I missed his funeral. Because I was uh, I was in jail that day. I missed a court date. So there was a warrant for my arrest. That's a fucked up story and a fucked up chapter that I wrote. cops came and got me out of my shower. I begged them to let me go to my dad's funeral. And they said, no, I should have thought about that before I missed court date. But how the fuck do you say that to somebody? Should have thought about your father dying before you missed court date. Well, he didn't know I missed the court date because my uncle just passed away three weeks prior. I had to go to his funeral in West Virginia during the same day that I was to appear in court for a misdemeanor. So fuck that cop. Fuck him. That heartless fucking prick. Fuck him. <laughs> or thank him. Because now I have to write a book just to deal with the shit.
John. Yeah. You ready to start your interview? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the next chapter of the book. No one inside, no alibi. We fade in faster than the speed of light. Took our chance. In the front, party in the back. But got back up again, and then I fell apart. But got back up again. Yeah. I picked him up. <laughs> he come out carrying a big black garbage bag with his clothes, and he had a pea coat on that I had printed for his clothes to him. He looked like he was getting off the boat. <laughs> And I thought it was so funny. <laughs> he says, I'm home. I said, yeah, sit for sure. Yeah. Both could see crystal clear That the inevitable end was near Made our choice trial by fire To battle is the only way we feel Yeah, that was the best, the best. So I picked him up and brought him home. Yeah. And he, but he changed. You know. I don't know, he's more, you'd say, not so happy-go-lucky like he used to be. He's more grown up. He had a lot of things on his mind he wanted to do. He wanted to do it right away. You know, and that's what he did. Went to school, part-time job. Got child support out of his part-time job, visitation rights for his son, and he's been doing great ever since. And I'm proud of him.
so let's go. Uh. Okay, go. Awesome. Alright, Annie, put the camera down and do some dishes. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs>